Hi, everyone. Welcome to part three of the 60s in Vietnam. Our questions to think about here, how and why did the United States get involved in the Vietnam War? And how and why did public opinion shift against the war? Before we begin, I just want to frame this as this is an incredibly brief version of the origins and the story of the Vietnam War because I want to place it within the context of the Cold War. I'm going to add a documentary to the folder uh, called Dick Cavett's Vietnam and it takes a look at kind of how the war starts and also how the war is being perceived by the American public. So take a look at that documentary in addition to this PowerPoint. So first of all, it's important to understand the context of how this happens. The area that we know as Vietnam had previously been part of a French colony called French Indochina, uh, what had been created during the 1800s. Today, this area is are the nations of Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. We mentioned during World War II that the Japanese had expanded greatly throughout the Pacific and they had actually moved into this area in late 1940, early 1941. And because the Japanese had moved into French Indochina, the United States really begins to put diplomatic limitations on trade with the Japanese. But once the Japanese are defeated and World War II is over, France is going to make an effort to reestablish control over their colony. But the challenge the French are going to face is that there is a growing independence movement in Vietnam. So what we see, first of all, is sort of this breakup of French Indochina into various parts. And with Vietnam specifically, the French are going to reinstate former Emperor Bao Dai as the leader of a quasi-independent Vietnam. Quasi meaning kind of, sort of. Ho Chi Minh is the leading figure working for Vietnamese independence, and he had been for years. As early as 1919, Ho Chi Minh had traveled to Paris when the Versailles Conference was being held. So as soon as World War I is over and world leaders start to talk about self-determination, that is when Ho Chi Minh begins the big push on the international stage for an independent Vietnam. But the problem, of course, is that Ho Chi Minh is not admitted into the Versailles Conference. And so we get that clearer picture that self-determination for world leaders means for Europeans. Poland, yes. Vietnam, definitely no. So Ho Chi Minh is adopting uh, communism after spending time in the Soviet Union and in China. And then when he returns back to Vietnam, he establishes the Viet Minh, or specifically the League for the Independence of Vietnam. And he begins working within the country to build an independence movement. And he's really trying to get world leaders to recognize the self-determination of Vietnam. And then, of course, World War II breaks out. They're invaded by the Japanese. And then once the war is over, the Viet Minh are effectively in control of the northern part of the country. And Ho Chi Minh declares Vietnam to be an independent nation. Of course, the French are not going to accept that. And by extension, the Americans are not going to either. But Ho Chi Minh is going to call upon the Chinese and the Soviet communists to help Vietnam attain this goal of independence. And of course, that is going to put Vietnam at odds with the United States in these early years of the Cold War. The French have made the effort to 
squash this independence movement. But of course, France was devastated by World War II and they have to rely very heavily on the United States for financial and support in terms of military equipment. In fact, by as late as uh, 1954, the United States is funding roughly 80% of the French effort to regain control over their colony. But it's disastrous. Uh, The French army is going to make one uh, sort of epic move to subdue the independence movement in Vietnam. And so there's this major battle at a northern city called Dien Bien Phu. But the French army very quickly finds themselves surrounded and they're forced into a humiliating defeat. The Geneva Accords were the peace conference discussing what to do with this area. Laos and Cambodia would be given their independence, but Vietnam would be divided at the 17th parallel or 17 degrees north latitude. The Viet Minh would be given temporary control of the northern part, and then a state of Vietnam was created in the south, headed up first by former Emperor Bao Dai, and then later this man, No Din Diem. Uh, You know, It's funny that the Geneva Accords makes this division, this temporary division of Vietnam, because it didn't exactly work well for Korea, but we're going to go ahead and try it here again. The idea was that there would be a unifying election held in July of 1956 to choose one leader to control the entire nation. But Diem knows that... Ho Chi Minh is so incredibly popular that if the elections are held, Ho Chi Minh is going to win. So Diem is going to convince the United States not to support the elections. And so the the elections that were scheduled are never held. So coming back to this idea of the Cold War, where does this all fit within this context? Keep in mind that the United States uh, is operating under the policy of containment. So we have this situation where the United States is following this philosophy that we talked about before with George Kennan, this idea of containment, that if we contain Soviet influence, communist influence from spreading You know, that was why we had the Marshall Plan and it's why um, we were involved in Korea. But it's also going to be uh, why we're going to be involved in Vietnam as well. But there's a secondary element here involved. And that was the idea of the domino theory. That if one nation in Southeast Asia falls to communism, then they all would. And this idea was supported by President Eisenhower. And then, of course, it's going to be picked up by the Kennedy administration when John Kennedy becomes the president. One of the the great uh, what-if questions that has been floated about is the idea that maybe if John Kennedy had lived, would we had been involved in the Vietnam War? And the problem with that question is that we just can't know. We we can't know the answer to that because John Kennedy was killed. But what we do know, what the evidence does show, is that Kennedy was not making any particular move to lessen American involvement in Vietnam. In fact, by the time of Kennedy's assassination, we have nearly 16,000 military advisors in South Vietnam advising the South Vietnamese government. So it doesn't appear that Kennedy was, was taking any steps to lessen American involvement. When Lyndon Johnson becomes the president, he's facing a lot of political pressure not to let Vietnam fall to communism. Uh, President Truman had faced a lot of criticism for letting 
China become communist on his watch. But the funny part about that is, is what was Truman going to do about it? I mean, other than launching the world into World War III, how was Truman ever going to prevent China from going communist. It just wasn't going to happen. But this is the atmosphere in which the American presidents are operating. There is, we're in the middle of the Red Scare. We have McCarthyism. There's this fear that the Soviet Union is winning. I know, I don't know what they're winning, but they're winning. And so Lyndon Johnson is facing this political pressure. And then in August of 1964, two U.S. ships in the Gulf of Tonkin. So when you look at the map and you see how the, the coastline sort of curves to the west and then comes back towards the east, that is the Gulf of Tonkin up there. And two U.S. ships claimed that they had been attacked by North Vietnamese vessels. And so when this information comes back to Congress and the president, Congress passes what is known as the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution that gives the president, that authorizes the president to, quote, take all necessary measures to repel any armed attack against the forces of the United States and to prevent further aggression. What's interesting about this is that Congress does not issue a declaration of war. In fact, we've mentioned it before. We're, we're living in April of 2020 right now, and the last time the United States declared war on anyone was 1941. And so building on Truman's precedent of sending troops into Korea, Lyndon Johnson is effectively given a blank check by Congress to expand American involvement and commitment in Vietnam, to making sure that Vietnam does not end up becoming a communist, a communist nation. So this brings us into this period of time that we call the Americanization of the war. So taking a look at the numbers on the screen here, from 1965 to 1969, we see a dramatic increase in the number of troops that are committed to this conflict. Now the problem is, uh, some have argued that the United States could have ended the Vietnam War very rapidly. I mean, we have nuclear weapons and North Vietnam does not. So we could effectively have turned North Vietnam into a parking lot, just destroyed the entire nation. But we didn't. And there's a reason. The reason is we want to make sure that American involvement is below a threshold that would bring in China or the, or the Soviet Union directly into this conflict. Thinking back to Korea for a second here, when once the American troops had pushed so far north into North Korea that they were nearly on the border with China, 300,000 Chinese troops came pouring into the conflict. So what the United States is doing here, and what I mean when I say a limited war with limited objectives, is we want to keep this conflict below a threshold that would draw in either China or the Soviet Union directly. Uh, so what the United States is going to do is, is kind of not try not to lose. And so bombing North Vietnam and trying to bomb the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which is this supply network from North to South Vietnam, funding the rebels, the Viet Cong in the South, it is really just not effective. The problem is, is that as the United States gets more and more involved in the war in Vietnam, 
a small protest movement begins to grow exponentially throughout the war. Uh, what has begun as the teach-in movement on college campuses, definitely taking some notes from the civil rights movement. You know, these strategies worked for the civil rights movement. We're now going to use them with an anti-war movement. And so building building interest on college campuses, particularly when it comes to the an issue of student draft deferments. Uh, this is sort of ironic in the sense that once the draft is implemented for the Vietnam War, those who were attending college were initially deferred from the draft. And so the, the most privileged students who are probably the ones uh, least likely to be drafted are the ones most vocally against the war. And then, of course, the protests expand as the war expands. One of the largest incidences happens in October of 1967, when more than 100,000 people demonstrated at the Pentagon. This is really building into um, a youth movement that's been in place throughout the 1960s, when the Students for a Democratic Society were created by two University of Michigan students, they, they sort of had this, the hope and promise that we mentioned before as their goal. They had a wide ranging platform from political reforms to racial equality to workers' rights. But once the anti-war movement begins to build, that becomes the focal point for SDS and other anti-war groups, student groups. Related, but tangentially, is the growth of the counterculture within American society. So breaking down this word, we think about the culture of American society and then something that's running counter to mainstream society. We've already seen college students challenging prevailing adult values. I mean, as this baby boom generation grows and reaches maturity, they have the highest high school graduation rates of any generation, and many of them are attending college. We have record numbers of young people attending college, but we talked about before in the 1950s this idea of a segregated population that young people are sort of in their own little world and they've really started to challenge and reject their parents habits and values and so with their clothing with their hairstyles with their work habits or sexual conduct or even their music young people are rejecting the commercialism the materialism the conformity of their parents generation and so for some of them this is you know you grow your hair long you wear colorful clothes you listen to rock music but for others they are taking this to an extreme these are the hippies of the 1960s. And whether they were in urban environments like the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco, or if they go back to the land and form a rural commune, they are definitely creating a society and a culture that is very different from their parents' generation. So coming back to our questions to think about, how and why did the United States get involved in the Vietnam War? It has everything to do with the Cold War, that we are still operating under the policy of containment. And when you throw in the element of the domino theory, all of a sudden, Vietnam takes on a strategic importance that really economically, politically, diplomatically, it just didn't have. And then how and why did public opinion shift against the war? As American involvement in the war expands and the draft is implemented, then you start to see some of that pushback against American involvement. And it has a lot to do with the baby boom generation coming of age and attending college in record numbers and just simply being unwilling to accept 
the the kinds of things that their parents generation were willing to accept so stay tuned for the fourth portion of the 60s in vietnam